We are pleased to introduce tonight's reader, Patricia Traxler, founder of Salina's Spring Poetry Series, is the author of a novel, Blood, and a short story collection, In the Skin, and four poetry collections, including the 2019 Kansas Book Award winner, Naming the Fires. She has twice been named Bunting Poetry Fellow at Radcliffe and has read or served as resident poet at many other universities, including Ohio State, Harvard University, Kansas University, the University of Montana, and Utah State. Her poetry has appeared widely, including The Nation, The Boston Review, Agni, Plowshares, Ms. Magazine, The LA Times, and in the anthology Best American Poetry. She is currently at work on her fifth poetry collection, Paradise. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm uh, going to read a little bit from each of my four published poetry collections and then two poems from my new collection in progress, Paradise. I'm going to start, because I'm um, notoriously insomniac, I'm going to read this one first. Notes at 2 a.m. I sit watching the night pass over you like a hand, your face pale clay in the moon drab room. I read once about a man in Russia who claimed he'd never slept. If I could meet that man, I'd knock him cold, then hold him near and whisper love songs while he dreamed. Um, I'm pretty old now, but when I was in my late 20s, I lost a baby. He was born and then I didn't lose him like miscarriage. I, he was born and then he died. Uh, and so in those days, it was different to be a woman. They let my husband see him, but they didn't bring him to me. So I have never seen him. And this is about, about that. Poem for my son. The baby's fine. They said you were fine. How was I to know that they say that to all the women? And so, belly emptied, I slept at last, leaving you breathing in your new chrome casket. They let him see you, but he didn't really look. I would have, I would have. And when I woke, you weren't. We're sorry, but the baby expired, they said, as if you were a credit card. He said you were small and wet. I tried to see you through his being, your face an undeveloped negative in his skull. I stayed years, hoping one day he'd find the words. I guess we never had much in common. I live alone now, and the only thing that he took with him when he left was what you look like. How I wish. Oh, baby, how I wish. I grew up in San Diego, but my dad was a Kansas farm boy. Kansas, I lived here for one summer when I was four. And I loved the weather and the big butterflies in the air. And I loved the warnings about what my grandpa called cyclones. This is a poem called Farmer, and it's about my grandfather. I used to watch him shaving at the kitchen table in a, with a pan of water. Farmer. <clears throat> My grandpa was a farmer, shaved with big hands on his straight edge, wiping gray goo onto a newspaper fold at the kitchen table. White chipped pan, warm, dirty water. He stared out at the fields, never missed a spot. His eyes were set deep like a crop he'd always hoped for. And he talked so slow that when he died and they laid him out in the parlor, and all the farmers swallowed hard and their women cried. I sat waiting for his next word. This is the first poem of mine that was ever published. I didn't know what the heck I was doing, so I sent it in a number 10 business envelope by itself, folded in thirds to the Nation magazine as if they would be interested. And for some crazy reason, Alan Plans, then the poetry editor there, took it 
And then I thought, wow, this is easy. And of course, it was like a couple of years before anything else got published. But this is called Our Finest Hour. <clears throat> By the way, I ran into Alan Plans. He's, he's passed away now, but I ran into him about 10 years ago in New York City when we were both at a Poetry Society of America thing. And I told him, you published my very first poem. And he did not remember me. He did not remember the poem. And then he told me that I look like a real estate lady. <laughs> That I didn't know why, but I guess, I mean, I was wearing a black dress. Is that what real estate ladies wear? I don't know. I, I didn't want to take it wrong, so I just said, oh. Our finest hour. In bed last night, I was an enormous piano, and your fingers were Eric Satie and his nine deep dreams. Today, the landlord evicted us for playing very loud music at 3.21 a.m. And this is really crazy. I have a poem in here called The Twister. And remember, I still was living in San Diego when I wrote this book. I didn't know diddly about weather in Kansas, but my dad would talk about it a lot. So Ms. Magazine took a few poems, including this one, to make a little section. And they, they titled it Midwest Poets even though I had never lived here yet. Now I've lived here for most of my life. But yeah, I thought that shows you how phony they are. And then they had in the background a picture of a tornado, all black and white and grainy. The Twister. When the Twister came, Mr. Blodgett's house collapsed, and all the razor blades from all those years fell out of the walls. The one that had nicked him pretty bad one Sunday in 1929 got him again but this time, he didn't feel it much. My second book of poems is called The Glass Woman. I'll read a couple of poems from there. This is something that really happened, I'm embarrassed to say. It's called The Contest of Nerves. My mother and her friend Louise used to compete over who was the most nervous. The Contest of Nerves. Ma and I were at Louise's house across the street again. I am so nervous these days, Louise. Oh, not as bad as me, girl. Mama and Louise held their hands out in front of them over the rusty sink to see who shook the most. Mama watched Louise's hands. Louise studied Mom's. I watched the shaking of each accelerate. See, Louise, mine are worse. No, mine. Just look, Eileen. By this time, Louise was motor-powered and Ma was revving up, but both were frowning now. I announced it was a draw. I was only five, but knew some things. The shaking stopped. The subject changed. We had such fun in those days. This poem is called Learning the Roads, and I wrote it the year that I moved to Kansas because I was earning a living by going all over the state in my car, uh, giving readings at various schools and teaching classes at various schools and then getting back in time for my kids to pick my kids up from school here in Salina. It's called Learning the Roads. 5 a.m. The road hunches against my wheels. Salina, Concordia, Ada, that plump October land slides by at each side in the dim air, strange as a new lover's body. A bare dusting of unseasonable snow lines limbs and eaves in the pre-dawn light. There are things coming toward me in time. I feel them just beyond reach. I want to learn how to converse with them before they show themselves. I want to believe in unseasonable joy. The sun moves up behind me, orange ball in the mist, past bare trees, cows graves, in soft fields while above them last night's moon still stands, flesh peeled away, translucent as you were near the last, as if what was to replace you could be seen through your skin. Where two roads converge, a crow waits at an empty truck stop. If you were still with me, would I be moving around this way? I know people are regularly lost to one another on the earth, Plum Creek, Beloit, it makes no difference who we are. The sturdy sun 
is waking fields of Milo, houses and families rouse without question under the Kansas sky. I don't know if other poets have a book that's their favorite one that they did. I sort of like um, Forbidden Words best, I think. This one is called How I Got This Way. It's a Catholic kid's angst. My dad was a Kansas Presbyterian, and when he met my mother, he very quickly became, of necessity, a California Catholic. And um, we just followed along. How I got this way. Our knees were knobby on linoleum, Donnie's and mine, and it was our worst moment ever, though we never knew for sure what curse had caused it. I think it was our mother reading The Family That Prays Together Stays Together somewhere, but there we were on a regular Tuesday night when I was eight, a night like any other, the kind of night that starts out good, my brother Donnie and I flicking peas across the dinner table while Mama and Daddy fought about his buddy Rudy who hung around our place too much and who was divorcing his reasonable wife. That was the kind of night it was, a good night like any other, when my mother put her fork down and announced that we were going to say the rosary together as a family on Tuesday nights with the radio tuned to a program called Family Rosary Hour. We were horrified, but when mom walked toward that radio, her body slanted with purpose. We knew there was no way out of it. When she said that we should all kneel then on our own living room floor near the record player in the Monopoly game in front of each other on a Tuesday, I saw my brother's errant eyebrow begin the dance, which meant that he was cornered and life was turning smelly. The floor squeaked beneath our knees as radio voices leapt into our house. Embraced by roiling static, they prayed like a chorus of bees. Mama was the first among us to join them. I watched her lips moving and listened, aghast at how my own mother's voice had merged with the voices in the static, those bees. As if she weren't actually one of us after all, but was some kind of spy, I considered reporting her. And even though the rest of us resisted, we were eventually lassoed by her eye, till in the end all the voices in our house had joined the voices of the bees that prayed across the airwaves. I could see neighbors out the window in the blue evening street, throwing balls and washing cars, being normal. We knelt there for years that night, avoiding one another's eyes, praying and staying together, murder in our hearts caught in holy static like travelers in a fog, led by the pale beacon of our mother's voice, together toward some promised land she'd always dreamed of. This is called The Fires, and it's about my first summer in Kansas. I had no idea about burning the fields. I was standing in my front yard on Santa Fe, at the little house that I had moved into, and it looked like Everything was on fire all around the town. So I wrote about it, the fires. No one questioned anything then, those slow summers on a windy plain. Tender shoots growing toward the sun, the way it gave them what they craved until it killed them. All around our town, we saw the prairie burning, and its musk rode the air like inevitability. The sky stayed hazy with that heat for days. There would be new starts after the familiar was burnt away. All day we could hear cicadas calling, limb to limb, in the hot, obliterating air. Cheri, cheri, cheri. After 17 years asleep in tree roots, emerging from darkness for a single month of touch, everything was on fire then craving more than hard thought would allow. What's taken before its time never dies. It merely sleeps just out of view, nascent power in half-light. Now, when the fires return each year, stealing what still seems new, we feel those same winds, hot and tender, 
the air wet with wanting, and the sun we'd yearned for burning the world away. And another Kansas phenomenon that I wasn't used to, having lived in a place where it's 72 degrees every day, and if it rains, everybody has a party, the waters. You could say we asked for it. We did everything but dance for it. Now, after the long drought, our world is drowning. Woods and fields lie deep in brackish water, and that odor holds up in the throat for days, caught like the rot of truths unspoken. The life we made is underwater. Wind and thunder batter the land all night, shake the walls. But I am calm with clarity. Faith and despair settle similarly in the skin, easing slowly past doubt. I can stand here at the window now and note the way the light from the moon has caught the rippling surface of the water as it rises to take the jutting cottonwoods, oaks, and elms. This is a very tiny poem for the baby I told you about. His name was Christian. Uh, because later, long after he was gone, I thought about how quickly, how, how short-lived his life was on the earth. Untitled for Christian. A small diminishment in the universe, nothing more. It was like one of those mercury switches on a wall that takes the light away without a sound. Like that, there, then not. He let go of it all in a second. My baby, my boy. Life force. I knew its presence by its absence, most in retrospect. This is kind of a crazy poem. It's called The Red Skirt. My, my, we, we had eight children in our family, and my mother was not a spoiled woman. She was a busy, hard-working woman who didn't get herself much. And when she wanted something, it impressed me so much that I never forgot it. This is about a red skirt she saw in a window of a store when we were driving from California to Waterville, Kansas, to meet the folks. The red skirt. It was the first time I ever saw her want something for herself alone. I remember it was some Arizona town, Tucson maybe, on our one vacation ever before six more babies came along. We were stopped at a traffic light when she saw it in a window. The cotton skirt, red handkerchief print, with a high elastic waist. Stopped on, she said softly, and her voice was like an actress or the bomb. It was some low-priced store like Learner's or National Dollar Stores, the window jammed with mannequins. Stopped on, though Daddy at the wheel at the red light was not moving anyway. Donnie was nearly six then. I was four and full of fear and admiration as our pretty mother ran across a lane of traffic, up a curb, across a sidewalk, her long legs cutting like scissors through the crowd. We drove around the block five times in Dad's old Mercury, watching for her anxiously. Fifth time round, we found her waiting with a brown bag, a different bag from grocery bags, more flat and thin and shiny. She was smiling a wide, shy smile I'd never seen. My mother climbed in, and we drove on toward the Grand Canyon while she pulled on the skirt right there in the car, lifting her bottom to clear the seat and then peeling off her old brown slacks beneath the skirt. And even Daddy was smiling then. Jesus, we were all smiling as we drove through Arizona, swathed in Mama's new red skirt. I miss my parents. They have been gone for about, uh, well, a few years. This poem is about what used to happen every time I went home and stayed with them. I wasn't going to church myself, but they would insist that I accompany them to Sunday Mass. And uh, this, is, this one is called Devotions. It's about there was a car being auctioned off 
of what, I guess you don't call it auction when people are buying tickets raffled off and you'll see what happens. Devotions. Two hours off the plane in San Diego, I realize I'm home and everyone is old. My hands are my mother's, hers are Gran's. Gran is dead now, so is the cat, so is the orange tree in the backyard. My parents persuade me to mass at Sunday noon, a tube block drive with dad fierce at the wheel, mom's brake foot working all the way, the much debated parking space and then they move with effort to the church, past a red convertible, raffled off for months now, hopeful parishioners lining up with dollars before each mass. Here and there, young Hispanic families cluster, sharing news. The Anglos are few, their faces aged, past recognition. My mother and father hold hands, passing the three-tiered baptistry, lead me to a pew at the rear of the church where the infirm and the tardy settle in. They can no longer genuflect. I see my father gazing at an 80-something woman in hot pink with Dolly Parton hair. The priest raises his hands. Wash us clean. Throughout the hour, my mother says her beads as if the grace of mass will fill her on her own without her personal participation. Wash us clean. Mama, I wonder where is your vehemence that used to scare me so? World without end, the priest says. I'm not so sure. I wake to a stir. My parents have joined the procession to the altar to receive the host. I watch their labored gate back to the pew where I wait with the other heathens. Old people, my father says to me or himself as he settles, looks around, get all beat up, don't they? He seems surprised. I don't know what to say. I take his hand instead. It may be the first time I've ever held his hand. Still a workman's hand is rough against my palm. My mother's lips move silently above her beads again. After Mass, they don't genuflect, but we cross ourselves with holy water, then squint against the sun as we pass the convertible again. Nice car, my father says, but no one ever wins it. This poem is called After a Snowless Winter. When I moved here, I'd never seen snow, and I'd never, most of my life had been spent in 72 degree weather, so. I love Kansas weather. That makes me one of few, I think, because a lot of the Kansans I know, including my own relatives, don't care for it much. I think it's wonderful. This is called After a Snowless Winter. March blizzard. The late snow covers our world like amnesia. All day, our eyes are drawn to the windows, absorbing the endless swath of white beyond glass that holds it apart, pristine, like a painting of what's real. I remember when we all were here, how winter warmed us then. Yes, attrition is a function of time and we have to ignore it as far as we can. Buy a new address book, forget the touch that woke our skin, the sweet imperative of meals, unruly music of children's voices, words alive in every room. Sunday wafer on the tongue, absolution, old miracles we still crave, love maybe. And before everything, the words that were to be believed, that gave us something to fear and love and live up to. Nothing left to chance except everything that would follow. The world is old now. War still abounds. Meaning refuses attachment. Bulbs stir in the ground, regenerate out of habit, away from the light. I'm yours, I tell the air. The cold makes its way in then, and for hours snow deepens across the prairie while frost blinds window glass. No ideas but in things, he said, and yet the world is clotted with things and often bereft of ideas. This belated freeze enters the flesh the way love did, a mercy, then makes its way into the heart and stays. The power to make something necessary, lasting, to place something new where nothing was. Anyone fears the loss of that and of the need. Somewhere underground now, a cold river hurries over itself, blind 
roots stirring as it passes, earth darkening around souls muted and stilled, stones smoothening in the passage of time, while above we wait and wonder, is this what we were meant for? Will we know then what was true? This is a poem called Naming the Universe. It's about how many things are extinct and how many things will be. Naming the Universe. There's a, there's a forward note, the definition of extinct from the Oxford English Dictionary. Adjective of a species, family, or other larger group having no living members, no longer in existence an extinct language, naming the universe. When we invented the world, we had to name everything and set the names to memory. We were hungry all the time when we were eternal. Mason River Myrtle, Santa Cruz Briophyte, Blue Antelope, Sea Mink. We went days without sleep. We could make worlds out of thought and life out of love. It was all so close to ruin. Viola criana, root spine palm. At night, the sigh of waves stealing home. At first light, a diminishment. Curiosity pulled the sun over the edge. Then the edge remained. So many words, all made of our living breath. Night heron, blue pigeon, dodo. Have we all been tricked? The things we named to make them real. Somewhere a list. Galapagos amaranth, Franklin tree, red gazelle, eel grass limpet, anomia, even a name for forgetting them, Peromnia secula seculorum, childless mother tongues, Etruscan, Apshira, Sumerian, broken buildings, smoke, the lies, melted snow uncovering what we used to know, the upward palms of the hungry, war and pestilence, transient memory, time's betrayal. Tiv, Tevu, the moon is down. Once we were in the world, we named the parts of it, seen and unseen, to make them eternal, shaping their names out of human breath. Luna, can this be the same one that called us then, dazzling, zoftic, generous from its bright eternity. I remember its pull on my skin, its promise, how we felt it then, called it love or knowledge. Tonight it looms flat as a coin, unspent, curiously cold. Luna, I remember a summer night, beach in Mexico, sweet rot of seaweed. I stole from a tent stood in the sand beneath the swollen moon. Vapor of sex rose from my skin in the chill black air. Between waves that lashed the land, I heard my heart, fierce, unfamiliar din of desire. Knew I was changing everything, knew the damage, yet I stayed. Tonight a light spring rain soaks the woods outside my window, the earth all moonlit, a stir with emerging crocus. I could go out there now, this minute, and be in it once again, the clamor and gnaw of growing things, stir of limbs in the wet, raw air, my skin taking it in, what remains. But no, let it sleep, let the limbs, the longings. After a while, anyone can become accustomed to a mild, dreamless expanse, and it's possible to settle in, invisible, for as long as it takes. Look there, the moon, aloof in its realm. See how it endures so well without us. Proof. It could be anything. Aroma of a mown field in deeper summer. Fireflies at dusk. Child with a jar to catch the light or the scent of a city street at morning, grimy, sexy smell of newsprint, people walking, a sudden laugh, belch of a bus pulling back into traffic. Somewhere in there, a boy tosses a stone 
at someone or something and his sister says, I'm telling. Their mother watches from a window, his red hair, her long limbs running to fetch the dog they've named after a man in a story. They were here once and that moment was their known universe. Maybe you held it all together. Dust motes hold them now. Random molecules endure. Where do moments go with no one to tend them? How can time survive the life that lived it or day go on without our conscious thought to animate it? Meaning forgets itself. Motes, molecules, a strand of hair, fragment of a song, the scent of laundry bleach or rain-wet concrete at evening. Anything might summon a lost universe, familiar and real, as if it had always been nearby in chiaroscuro or lingering just out of reach, churning with innocent wants and expectations. Then, just at the verge of return, nearly incarnate, it all evaporates, and with it a half-formed narrative dissolves into ether like the baby who breathed his first and last in one day while the sun persisted in lighting the world. Come back. Time was never enough. She returns to the window. Where is the proof of what was real? Give me proof. The last two poems I'll read are from my new book in process, Paradise. Innocence. The simplest things I've loved inspire wonder in me now or wound me. Morning glories crawling over the splintered fence at first light on Whiteman Street. Seaweed nudging me beneath the mossy sway of salt waves while my parents spread towels over the sand. My mother's long ago garden and her eternal certainty. My Irish grandmother's room astir with handwritten poems that burnt through the page. My father's hands and knees so stained from work they wouldn't clean. My older brother bent over his study of the Feistos disc as he ate alone in his room while the other ten of us gathered at the table. And all around me there, the chatter of six younger siblings whose diapers I'd once changed and whose mouths had opened eagerly for soft meals I'd spoon from Gerber's jars. We were all together there once in our small house, sharing meals our mother prepared with supplies we bought from Benny Yee the neighborhood grocer who allowed us to charge our weekly purchases on a store account because we had to eat and he trusted we would always pay eventually. Would I bring it all back tonight if I could because it was true? Is childhood ever our own truth anyway? Don't I prefer the comfort now of quiet and solitary nights with my own thoughts and music and my self-directed labor to occupy me? I wonder if memory misnames itself as happiness and if anyone was truly happy in our old days. Or did we withhold our discontent from one another in order to keep our life together? Didn't we leave it all at the very moment we found the way? And for my last poem, I'll read after. Oh, we become so maudlin at the edge of eternity, as if no one else has been here or will be. Where are the trumpets, the swans, the assembled masses? The quiet air rebukes us. See there the stray orange tom creeping by like a felon, belly close to the stones. He's past his prime, but still on the hunt. Nearby, the blighted elm manages to acknowledge the seasons. And what choice has it rooted there? After years of rehearsals, inarticulate goodbyes, after everything, what's left to us but the stern economy of days and the sound of our own footfall in the hollow of night? You, alone there, hesitant, new as a child. Thanks.